All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's great to see all of you here. We're going to change the order of the uh, uh, baptism a little bit. Um, as you guys know, the access retreat is going on right now, or is just finished, and they're heading down, and they hit some traffic. So traffic in LA? I don't know, you know, something like that. But uh, uh, for, because they wanted to also be a part of the baptism uh, for our members, our seven members here, uh, we're going to change the order, uh, and we'll have the baptism after the message is done. So here we go. Hi, my name is uh, Steve. Um, I know probably a lot of you don't know me. I, uh, I am the newest pastor here at uh, Southland. I joined staff about uh, two and a half months ago, um, although I'm not new to uh, Church of Southland. Our family's been attending here for about uh, four years now, three going on four years. Um, it's... Uh, just to give you a little bit of introdu introduction to myself, um, I, I'm married, um, have been married for 27 years. We have three kids, uh, one who's access age and one who's college age, and then one who's a high school student. Uh, our younger two daughters are here um, um, at Church of Southlands and uh, a part of our family here as well. Um, I, uh, a little bit of an, I guess, an oddball pastor in that, uh, or maybe you could say special. Um, I am a bivocational pastor. And what that means, if you don't know, is that uh, my alter ego is a uh, IT manager at USC. I don't know if we have any SC students here, but uh, so in my daytime, I, I, I do IT supporting the, uh, the faculty, staff, and students um, at SC. Uh, but my passion, um, and has been my passion for many, many years, is to do the good works of God, which I'm going to be talking a little bit about today um, in our series in Ephesians. I'm so thankful here to be giving this message before you. And uh, I know I, since Access is mostly not here, most of you guys are college students, right? Okay. If you're not a college student, raise your hand. Probably just a few of you. Yeah, yeah, just a few. So it's great to, uh, great to be with college students because, again, I have college-aged uh, children, and as they experience uh, all of the just the ins and outs of college life with, uh, um, and then, of course, in the center of that is the, is the faith, right? Their faith that they are learning and maturing in. It's great to be here and speak with you. And, in fact, part of my testimony, which I'll be going into a little bit later, is that um, college was a time where I really grew, matured, where I, I met the Lord earlier in my elementary school years, but it wasn't until college that I realized what real faith is, uh, that I realized what it means to be uh, not just a believer, uh, but one who understands that relationship with Jesus Christ, and that with that relationship with Christ, having a life transformed, living a life transformed, um, and again, I'll share with you uh, as we go into the message a little bit more of my story that's there. What I'd like to do is uh, we're going to be talk, uh, reading from Ephesians chapter 2. And since it's uh, with this, I know we haven't done this a while in Church of Southland, but I'd like to do some responsive reading. So we're going to be looking at 18 verses. Um, uh, and before we do that, we're going to say the Southland Proclamation, which I forgot to do. All right. So why don't you raise your Bibles uh, that you have with you, and then uh, we will go and read our Southland Proclamation. Um, ready? This is the word of God. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can. I'm a precious child of God, forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, his son. I desire to be filled and led by the Holy Spirit day by day so that the promise of God may be fulfilled in and through my life. Amen. Excuse me, this is actually my first sermon here at Church of Southlands, so bear with me, but we're family, so I want to be as comfortable as possible, and again, as responsive as possible can be as I share this message today. So let's uh, go to Ephesians chapter 2, and what we're going to do by responsively, I'm going to read the first verse, and I'm going to have you read the second verse, and we'll alternate as we go through these 18 verses here. So I'll begin, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 18. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. God, 
even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were off, were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. And he came and preached peace to you who were far and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Amen. <sighs> Ephesians is one of my favorite, favorite books in the Bible. Um, Ephesians, uh, I think Pastor Joe last week, as he gave the introduction to the first uh, uh, message, um, he gave you a little bit of the background, right? Ephesians was the letter the Apostle Paul wrote uh, while he was in prison a little bit later in Rome to the church that he had planted, that he had served, that he had uh, poured out his sweat and tears with. In fact, Ephesians was the city where Apostle Paul in his missionary journeys spent the most amount of time. He spent over two, almost three years in that city. So he grew, he grew to know them and to love them. Ephesians was a sprawling, flourishing city of that time of 300,000. You guys may think 300,000 in our day, it's not that big, right? But in ancient times, that was a big city. In fact, in the Roman world, it was probably the second largest city uh, in that empire. One of the things that it was also famous for was that it had the Temple of Artemis. And the Temple of Artemis was this gigantic, colossal temple. And if you, some of you history buffs might know, it was one of the wonders of the ancient world, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. In fact, if you look at the size of it, all that's left in Ephesus now, at least the ruins, is just the base, but it was as big as a football field, over 300, 400 feet wide, long, 200, over 200 feet wide, 60 feet high. It was a colossal structure made at that time with just colonnades and uh, just a beautiful structure that many people from all over the world came and to worship. As you know, in that time, uh, there was worship of many different gods, and Ephesus was one of those flourishing areas where, uh, where it was highlighted, I think partly because of the temple and because of the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the culture and the environment at that time. Now, Apostle Paul came to this place on his third missionary journey, and it, he came to teach first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And so he did what he usually did. He went in and he started teaching. He started preaching. He started sharing with them the, what Jesus Christ had done for him, what the scriptures told about Jesus Christ, and how the relationship with Jesus Christ would transform and change their lives in such amazing ways. If you look at the six books of Ephesus, Ephesians, you'll see that there are the first three books. And this is why it's such a, it's an amazing book in that the first three chapters are basically the theology of the gospel of Christ, the good news of Christ. In it are captured every, um, almost everything that talks about what happened, what can happen, and what will happen through the relationship with Jesus Christ. So the first three books, you can kind of think of it as theology, and then the uh, four through six, you can think of it as the practical aspects. So after you believe, after you have faith, what happens next? What do you do? What is that life that's transformed? And what does it look like? 
And as we continue through the, uh, the, the letter of Ephesians, to the Ephesians, we'll be investigating and learning uh, more about that. So let's dig in. What we just read was uh, the first 18 verses of Ephesians chapter 2. And here, I think we can be summarized with, um, let's see if I can get this thing to work, uh, basically with the, um, uh, the beginning part of it. And we're going to go over the first few verses there. I think the best summary, and this is what the title of my message here is that, remember the old and live the new. Remember the old, but live the new, okay? Apostle Paul here goes in the first uh, few, uh, few, first verse, in fact, right? He says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, right? And I think, I'm gonna trust that this is going on, I, again, going back and forth here, but. Uh, Trespasses here and uh, uh, sins are two words, and we're going to learn a little bit of Greek. I know we have some Biola students, so you probably are way better at Greek. Um, I, my Greek was like 20 years ago when I went to seminary. So, uh, but the word for trespasses is para, paraptoma, okay, paraptoma. And that word basically means, uh, if you look up a Greek dictionary and you translate it, it basically means uh, violation, right? It means that you've crossed a boundary that you're not supposed to cross, and you've done something and violated some rule or some law that's there, right? So if you think about it, that's, bring it into a little bit uh, a more modern day, right, is that I know many of your students, so you're taking a test, right? You studied hard for this test. Some of you just finished finals or going into finals. You've worked really hard, and you get the answer sheet, and, I mean the question sheet, and you're looking through it, and you're going through it, and you get to one question, shoot. I studied that. I know the answer, but I just can't quite get it. But it just so happens that the smartest kid in the class is sitting right next to you, right? I know I studied it. I can get the answer. I wonder what Max wrote down on his paper. And you get, and you stray a little, and you look over, and oh, I'm just gonna get a little bit of an idea, and then I can figure out the rest, right? Your eyes have crossed over that boundary where you weren't supposed to go. It was an active decision to go against what the set rules are, right? The second word that we get is hamartia, uh, which is the word for sins, right? And again, hamartia means, uh, it literally means mixing the mark. It means that, you know, in an archery field with the bullseye that's there, you're, you're pulling back your arrow, you shoot, and you don't get the bullseye. It goes off errantly somewhere else, and you're missing the mark, right? So it's as if there is a set of standards that are there, but you just don't meet those standards. You don't match up. You don't get to those. And of course, as we know, God's standards are pretty high. When he created us, he created us perfect, and they are actually the highest. If these two words were put together, we could call it the sin of commission, the first one, right? Paraptoma, the sin of acting, violating, and then the second word, hamartia, missing the work is more of like omission. Pastor Keith talked about this a couple of weeks back uh, in our um, uh, first and second services, and he talked about how that some things that we commit, some things we don't even know about maybe, but we miss that mark. We don't attain, right, what God's standards, what his desires, what his will is for us. When we combine these we have to see, Apostle Paul was a masterful, masterful writer, uh, rhetorician, is that the right word, right? He was an intelligent, he had, as a Pharisee, he probably had the first five books of the Bible memorized, right? And he captures in this, in just this first verse, the whole gamut of transgressions, right? Of trespasses and sins, and that is to fall short of the glory of God. When um, it goes on, uh, we were dead, and so we were separated. Isaiah 59, 2 says, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear, so that he does not hear. What we see here from both of these things is that this death is caused because we are separated from God, because we have committed or we have omitted to follow, right, the standards that he set for us, and so we are dead. And so we are dead. If you think about this, this death, of course, we're talking about spiritual death. Um, 
which is the most important thing because we are spiritual beings. We were created in the physical. We were born, right? We lived, we breathe, but there is more to us than just the physical and the material. There is more to us even than the mind. God created us with a soul, a spirit that lives on, not just in this life, but even when we take our last breath, that will go on eternally, right? And so what is more important, the physical or the spiritual death that the Apostle Paul here is talking about? That's what we want to think about. That's what we want to analyze as, again, Apostle Paul here is speaking to the Ephesian church and reminding them, here is the most important thing. Are we dead spiritually or are we alive spiritually? That's here. You know, we live in L.A. Um, L.A. is known, right? It's beautiful weather all the time. I spent uh, uh, many years overseas. Um, in fact, just recently, before we came back to Orange County, uh, we spent four years in Chicago, our family did. And, um, Chicago's cold. Six months of the year, you can't even go out and do anything. They huddle up, go to the nearest indoor place, they go back inside, and then you're there, right? Um, L.A., you can go outside any time, right? You can go outside, you can ride, you can run, you can hike, you can do all the beautiful things that, uh, uh, that the outdoors has. And, of course, L.A. is known for the golden bodies, right, the beautiful people. We have Hollywood right next door uh, where you have the beautiful actors and actresses that are out there. But when you... When God sees us, he doesn't see us for that external self. He sees our spirit. He sees our soul that goes on eternally. And that's what he looks on. And what he cares about is, is it dead or is it alive? Is it dead or is it alive? As we think about that, let's go on in this passage. And we see, um, as we look at this uh, next slide, right? Apostle Paul goes on in verse 2, it says, In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the, sen in the sons of disobedience. Here Paul is not just saying that you're dead if you don't know Christ, if you have not that relationship with him, but that also that you are enslaved, right? And this is a concept that's a little bit hard for especially, you know, we're in America, right? We're not slaves to anyone. We're uh, the most free country in the world. I spent time in the former Soviet Union. I've spent time in China, uh, where you don't have the freedoms that we have. But here, Apostle Paul is directly saying, the sin that comes when we are enslaved because of our separation from God, right? He says it's the course, slaves to the course of this world. And here, I want to talk about a world, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's called worldview. And what worldview means is how you see the world, what your perspectives are, right? How you view the world. And based on that worldview, right, everything else comes. It's the filter by which we sort, organize our lives that are there, right? In the worldview, right, of, of communism, there is no God. In the worldview of secularism, materialism, there is no God. It's what you see, what you touch, what you eat, what you taste everything that the senses that are there. But in the most important aspect, which is of the spirit, we have to see, right, that um, we can become enslaved in the course, courses of this world. I want to uh, uh, bring up uh, 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 this big three words that are there. Um, how many of you have heard of moralistic therapeutic deism? Oh, we have a few, good, 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 okay. You guys must be Bible students, right? No, you just heard it, okay. This is a word that I came across about maybe 10 years ago as I was reading a book. And what it basically describes is, um, oh, it's from a, a, a book uh, and some research done by Christian Smith and then Ken DeCrecy Dean, who is a, uh, a professor at Princeton University, wrote this book called Almost Christian. And basically she described what she saw in the research, right? What they found was an American Christianity out there that is, as it describes here, belief in a God who remains distant from people's lives. People are supposed to be good to each other. The universal purpose of life is being happy and feeling good about oneself. There are no absolute moral truth. God allows good people into heaven, and God places very limited demands on people. Yeah. What he's describing is a lot of the Christian churches that are in our country 
and in our world, actually, right, that believes in, well, moral life is good. Yeah, you don't want to kill each other. You don't want to steal from each other, right? But it's a God that is distant. It's a God, deism, right, is a belief in God, but not in an active, living, relational God, which is what the God of the Bible here talks about. Moralistic therapeutic deism is about a faith, right, that comes and you go to church to make yourself feel better. You hear a message about how God loves you, God's merciful about you, but you don't hear the full truth of what the Bible says about death from separation because of sin and a faith that often is not real faith because it doesn't prove true to what the Bible is saying. Um, in fact, in some of the studies that were here that came as a result of that, in fact, there was just another study that was done in 2021 by Barna Research, and they said that three quarters of the people, three quarters of the people that attain or that live by these principles, moralistic therapeutic deism, they believe they're Christians. Three quarters of them do. But if you look at, see what their faith is, the researchers came up and said only about 16% of those people would actually qualify or fit into what the Bible says about what real Christianity is, right? I don't think it, you don't have to go far, right, to look at that. I, maybe uh, uh, you know of people, right, in your schools, you know of people, friends, right? They say they're Christian, but God is not a part of their lives at all, right? They say they're Christian, they grew up in a Christian house, household, right? They believe that God and, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit even, but, there is no active reality of faith in their lives. And what the Bible and what uh, it, it, Apostle Paul definitely, right, when he was writing these letters, trying to convince them, trying to teach them, what he uh, told time and time again was that God is an active, living God who wants to be the closest, most integral, intricate center of our hearts and our lives. Not a deist God that believes that he's far away, but one, in fact, that is near uh, and that takes uh, a part and wants to take a part in our lives. Um, in the next verse, in verse 3, it goes on a little bit, and it says that we are also slaves to the lusts of our flesh. Um, among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Mm. There's nothing wrong with food. I love good food. I love good Korean food. I love good Italian food. I love a lot of different types of food. Uh, I'm sure many of us can relate with that. There's nothing wrong with rest. I love sleeping. I wish I could sleep more. Unfortunately, working and, uh, and family and all that, I, I don't get to sleep as much as I, I, I get, you know, as I want. And uh, as a married person, right, I've come to uh, know and to learn to enjoy what sex has become a part of. Not what this world says, right, but within the confines of what God had ordained in marriage, right? All of these things that have been given by God as a gift, but when we take it outside of the context of God, we become enslaved to. In fact, John Stott, um, a famous theologian, puts in this, in his commentary on Ephesians, when food becomes gluttony, when sleep becomes laziness, when sex becomes lustful indulgence, then we have been enslaved to the lust of the flesh and the desires of the flesh and of the mind. I wanna sit there and just, you know, park ourselves just a moment. The picture that is painted of a life without God, right? I think in one sense or another, we've all experienced. Apart from God, the loneliness. Apart from God, the hopelessness. Apart from God, maybe losing ourselves in the pleasures of the world that aren't pleasurable very long. This is the separation from God because when our spirit is cut off, when our spirit is torn apart because of our sins from God, then that's where we go, that's where the result is. 
Today, you know, we're gonna have the baptisms. We've had 31 baptisms today, in fact, amazing day. You know, part of that is it gets to celebrate the lives that were changed, right? How one will be sharing, uh, there was one person in each service, but how each of them, as part of the baptism, they had to write their testimonies, right? Life before God, how you met God, and life afterwards. Maybe some of you, it hasn't even been that long, right? But what it can be. Uh, these testimonies are of what was separated and has been brought together now. And this is what I want to focus on in the second half is, right? But God, but God. Yeah, I did paint a pretty bleak picture, but I think we have to be realists. I'm, I'm an optimist. Let me tell you, if you ask my family, right, I'm an optimist. I always see the glass half full. That's why God put me with the pessimist. My wife is the glass half empty person because she knows that I needed a realist to kind of uh, balance that optimism, right, that's there, right? Because if you're always all too optimistic, you miss a lot of things, right, especially important things. Um, but... God, while we were still in sin, he did something that we, two weeks ago, celebrated through the death and resurrection of Christ, made a way that we would not be left in sin. In fact, it says here, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, and by grace you have been saved, right? This is a powerful verse. In fact, we're going through, I, I think every verse, probably every verse in the Bible, right? But especially in Ephesians here, where it's talking about that life, that separation, and what God did in his rich mercy, in his rich, generous mercy that he gives. While we were still lost in that sin, while we were still not very lovable, while we were still rejecting, God came, right? And he loved us. And he provided a way out of, out of that place of separation. Mm. Verse six and seven goes on and says, and raised us up with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus, right? Then we get to the most famous verse, of course, right? That uh, if you grew up in the church, you learned it, probably you memorized it, right? Um, uh, <laughs> there's a funny song when I was growing up, right? Uh, it, it's based on this verse, and I'm not gonna sing it for you because I'd probably uh, embarrass myself doing it, but um, that grace, by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, right? This is the amazing Ephesians 2, 8, right? And 9 that tells us that God made it possible, not because we were able, but God made it possible because of his grace and mercy to come back to him and to enter into that relationship with him through Jesus Christ. But, right? What are we created for? Why were we created? Why were we given that salvation? And this is where I want to kind of spend the rest of this, uh, um, this afternoon on, is that what were we created for? And I think sometimes we often, and I think the therapeutic, uh, uh, the, the moralistic therapeutic uh, deists, those that would follow along with that, would stay parked in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, but they wouldn't get to verse 10, right? Which says that, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared uh, beforehand so that we would walk in them. And then Isaiah 64, 8, another famous passage says, but now, O Lord, you are our father, we are the clay, you are the potter, and all of us are the work of your hand. Here, it's describing that not only were you saved, not only were you brought back together, not only were you given life, made alive through that connection again, through Jesus Christ, but we are his workmanship and we are his potter. When we entered into that relationship with God, from that point on, God is gonna be shaping you, molding you, changing you, transforming you from the inside out into the perfect, beautiful image 
that he originally destined for us, originally destined for us. What that workmanship can be, I don't know. But you know, I love talking with college students and much of uh, my ministry or the, the ministry that I was involved with was with college students. Um, to give you a little bit of the story because as I share my story, I hope, right, maybe to give you some ideas, um, to give you some thoughts that at this point in time, right, as in your 18s, 19s, 20s, right, that you can be reminded of what that workmanship is and to see how God can really make that change. Um, I grew up about five miles from here in Fullerton, so I'm an Orange County boy, right? Um, in fact, I lived in Fullerton before a lot of the Asians came. Um, if you guys know Fullerton now, right, uh, Sunny Hills, which is the high school I went to, um, is like over 50, 60% Asians now, right? Um, I grew up in that area. I grew up, uh, uh, my family, my younger sister and I, um, my parents immigrated. I came when I was five from Korea. Grew up in the church. My parents were um, uh, deacons and elders in the church. And so grew up in a fairly, fairly safe environment. In fact, I could say very safe environment. Our parents provided for us. They worked hard. Um, they, uh, they did everything to help us to get situated here help us to study, help us to advance, go to good colleges, all that, right? And I grew up in that kind of, um, in that kind of environment. Um, I met Christ when I was in elementary school, later elementary school. Um, I, I, I prayed the prayer and I began that relationship, but I don't think I understood what it really was as I shared about it a little bit earlier. It was in college, I think, that it made that difference. I think one, I left home, right? I went off to you know, Northern California to go to college. I started living on my own. My parents weren't there to, you know, do this, do that, instruct, what, you know, all those things that were there. And I started to see things from, I think, a more adult perspective. Um, I, one of the things, of course, as you know, a believer, right, is to try to find a good fellowship in a good church, and uh, God thankfully provided that. And in that church, I started to grow and be discipled, right? I know some of you are being discipled. Some of you are being mentored, right? I started to do Bible studies for the, not the first time, but really actively participating and learning and seeing like books like Ephesians and other books, what that, the richness of what God's word has. And through that time, I, I, I was able to really grow uh, in Christ and mature. Um, sophomore year, I went to a, a, a uh, a missions conference that was held at a, a local seminary that was there. And there, God just like, boom, he just like, he just blew me away, right? I remember um, going and hearing about the testimonies of those that had um, uh, gone overseas and they came back and they were sharing about their times and their experiences. Here I was that um, pretty much all my life, I grew up in Southern California, uh, Northern California, um, uh, with all of the benefits of being in the States, upper middle class uh, society or whatever, and all the benefits that came as a result of that. I'd never struggled, I never was hungry. I never even had that inability to hear God's word, the incredible message of Christ. And they were coming back with stories and just sharing about how these people had never heard and I, I, was, just, I was just blown away. And God put it on my heart, you know, uh, uh, that uh, uh, the mission field is where God wanted me. So uh, from that time on, I started praying and preparing. Um, I was a pre-med back then, uh, doing all the bio classes and a very, you know, the immigrant story, right? Lawyer, doctor, engineer, right? Those are, in fact, all of my friends were one of the three. Yeah, all of my Asian friends were anyway. Um, going through the process, seeing how God would use me. Um, but there was an opportunity right after I graduated from college to, um, uh, to go into the mission field uh, for the first time. And so I had no idea what was out there. I had no idea what mission was. Uh, I had grown and matured and Bible studied, mentored and things like that. But there were many aspects of it that in one sense I was not very naive about. But God put it on my heart. He opened the doors and I ended up going to half, exactly halfway around the, other, uh, the world in Central Asia in this little country called Uzbekistan uh, and this uh, uh, city called Tashkent, um, I went in there and it was still the Soviet Union. On my passport, right, it was the USSR, the, the, the Russian equivalent. And I know you guys have studied and all that uh, in your history classes, but I went in there at the very end of that um, and as the Soviet Union was breaking up, right, already Berlin, had, you know, the wall had fallen and through that time, 
I went in, and all around me uh, were young people, older people. I was working with the Russian Koreans that were there. Um, from 70-year-old grandmas and grandpas, middle-aged, you know, fairly successful in their areas, and young people, college students, high school students, that had never opened up a Bible, that had never, ever heard about who Jesus Christ was. Literally, they had never heard who Jesus Christ was, never had that opportunity. Um, God placed me there. He allowed me to share uh, this precious message of separation, of sin, of life through Jesus Christ, of what that hope was. Because, you know, if you guys know in that history, right, is that in the Soviet Union, um, what they taught was that God was not there. If you look at communism, and I had to study it being in that area, you know, to know the culture and the environment that was there, if you look at the basis of it, a lot of it sounds very good. It's very familiar. In fact, it's what the Bible says about sharing, you know, of, 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 of not having, you know, haves and have-nots and all that. But what they did and what Karl Marx did and what the communists did was they took out, they took out the God part about it. They tried to make a secular society to build it into that perfect society. And after 70 years, after 70 years, right, uh, it was nowhere near where the ideals were. In fact, every utopian society, every attempt at trying to do, to create this heaven on earth, right? If you look through the history, has failed, has failed. And if you look at communism and what it's done, right? They may not, you know, even in China right now, which is still technically communist, right? If you look at it, the, the secular communists have killed more people in the 20th century, right? Millions and millions of people than any war, than any famine, natural cause, natural disasters, because they took God out of that picture. God gave me the opportunity to share with them and to just, uh, uh, I remember the first baptism that we had. Um, we went to a pool, outdoor pool, and here were these grandmas and grandpas, these middle-aged men and women, mothers and fathers, these young, young, young men and women that had finally come to receive this precious gospel message, had their lives transformed, had hope brought back into their lives because their lives were just completely disintegrated. The society had disintegrated, disintegrated. There was no hope, right? No future for them. No. There, God allowed the precious gospel to come. And that changed the course of my life. Um, I've had the opportunity to serve. Our families had an opportunity to serve in different places. Um, God directed me through that. That was God's work, his workmanship in me, changing, transforming, so that I could meet him, so that I could grow in him, so that I could have that opportunity to be shaped, beautified, made into that object that God was pleased with because, because of the work that God did, his initiative, his bringing into, his renewal, his transforming process that continues. that through that meeting of Christ. I just wanna to touch upon a couple more things here, and that is, one of the things that Apostle Paul says four times in this chapter here, but also 164 times in his writing is this concept of being in Christ. The phrase means to be organically related to Christ. No more hostility with God, no more separation or alienation from God, right? To be in Christ. When we are in Christ, when we open ourselves to allow him to continue to change and transform us, to grow us, to show us, right? Yes, all of you will be looking for how you will become con constructive members of society, right? right? To become respected citizens and individuals. But in that process, how in Christ God will show and reveal and work in you to make you into that beautiful, beautiful masterpiece, workmanship, that clay in the hands that can be shaped into that beautiful pottery that's there. Uh, 
2 Corinthians 5, 7, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new things have come. One of the things in this passage um, that we see is that as a result in verse 14, and I want to stay um, and just talk about this a little bit. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. I didn't go into a lot of what we read about, you know, the separation between the Jews and the Gentiles, right? The non-Jews and how God brought them together. Um, how God brought into a society. I think next week, uh, uh, Pastor Josh is going to talk about the community and the building up of it and how that, uh, uh, how that works itself out. How the church is and what it does, right? But what I want to challenge you and what I want to speak to you about is that only in knowing and being in Christ can we understand what true peace is. Can we understand what it means to be whole, right? What it means to be whole. What is peace? What is peace? In our world, right, we have wars going on. We've been praying for Ukraine. We have so much anti-peace, right? Maybe right now some of us are struggling with things that are taking away the peace. Uh, the shalom, right? In Hebrew, the word is shalom. The wholeness that comes from being alive in Christ. I know as uh, young people, I know that you, as I did when I was your age, have plenty of things that take away that peace. Uh, it could be the active sins that we may be involved in. It could be some of the things that we may even not know yet, but as we read, God convicts us, right? It could be that for some reason, we've really pushed God away We've not allowed him to come into the center of our hearts. Maybe for some of you, you don't have that relationship with God yet. Right? Maybe you came for a baptism to some of your friends invited you, right? I don't know what stage you're at in your lives right now, but God does. He knows and he sees. He wants to restore to us that life. He wants to give us that wholeness that completeness that comes from being made alive in Christ to receive that shalom that God gives to us. He wants us to take part in that. And then he wants to continue that work. He wants to continue that work. How can you serve? Even now, how can you serve, right? We have the education ministry out, right? And uh, they're going to be, you know, they're looking for volunteers. And I know as uh, being part of staff, right? We're always in need of volunteers, right? Children, junior high school, high school. Um, there's other ways, maybe in your campuses, how to serve. Maybe in your workplaces, how to serve. Maybe within your own families, how to serve, right? What God places in your heart as you receive the peace and the joy and the life that comes, how will God move and shape you and make you into that beautiful, beautiful workmanship, right? That's what God wants. That's what Ephesians chapter 2 is talking about. That's what we're reminded of. And as, as I look back, as I look back, I'm, as I get on to the elder stages, I'm excited. I'm so excited. As I see in my own children how God is working and serving as I see, right, your bright faces, although some of you are behind masks, I know, but I can imagine the beautiful faces, the glowing ones that God is doing as he works in our lives, as we'll hear about in the testimony, as we celebrate what God does and continues to do. Um, let's allow that to happen. If we have sins to confess, let's confess them. If we have new ways that God is reaching us, pushing us towards, let's go out and reach and move into that way. How God can use you, uh, uh, I'm so excited about. Yeah, I love seeing young people because you guys have so many years ahead of you that God can do amazing and wonderful things. 
And that's what we'll be praying about. That's what we'll be supporting you uh, in as a pastor. Uh, definitely so. And as a church, definitely so. Let's close in prayer. Father God, I thank you for allowing me to share um, your word, the amazing words of Ephesians chapter 2 that says, um, that says we were dead, that says that, Lord, we were lost. Lord, we needed you, and so you did come, and you showed us. You revealed yourself. You gave us your son, Jesus Christ, and you made us alive. You gave us the opportunity to become alive. Not only that, Lord God, I'm excited because I know that you are working in so many of these young people here in this, in this uh, uh, congregation. Lord, you are shaping, you are molding, you are challenging, you are pushing. You are allowing them as I was able to experience years ago what it means to be touched by the Spirit, shaped by your word, given the opportunity and privilege to serve you and your kingdom. Father God, you're an amazing God. I thank you so much. As we come now and as we respond in song, as we respond in hearing of testimonies, as we join in the celebration of baptism, Father God, as we thank you and praise you, Lord God, may our lives, our, our hearts be turned to you, to continue to receive, but not just to receive, to learn to give in service. Father God, we thank you for this amazing relationship we have with you. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.